Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and faithfully follow you. Let us all pray together Psalm 15, I think, found on page 5. Lord, who may dwell in your tabernacle? Who may abide on your holy hill? Whoever leads the blameless life and does what is right, who speaks the truth from his heart, there is no guile upon his tongue. He does no evil to his friend. He does not keep contempt. Wicked is rejected, but he honors those who fear the Lord. 
A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Colossians. Christ Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. And you who were once estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his fleshly body through death, so as to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him provided that you continue securely established and steadfast in the faith, without shifting from the hope promised by the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. I, Paul, become a servant of this gospel. I am now rejoicing in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am completing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body that is, the church. I became its servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known, the mystery that has been hidden throughout the ages and generations, but has now been revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is he whom we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone in all wisdom, so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people.
St. Augustine will say, God loves you as if you're the only person in the world to which you're saying. <laughs> and then, of course, Augustine goes on and says, and he loves everyone as if they're the only person in the world and you say. <laughs> but that's the way it is. Well, where were we last week, you regular church folks? Where were we last week? We found ourselves as mere mortals seeking immortality, embracing existential stance rather than maybe shopping for Frosted Flakes and whipped cream. Your first errand is to go to church as a mere mortal and seek immortality, and I find that thrilling. I find it so thrilling that I get weepy reading the gospel about the one thing necessary, listening to Jesus being within time and space so thrilling to be in church. So we find as mortals last week the medicine of immortality, as St. Ignatius of Antioch says, the medicine of immortality, the real presence of Christ's body and blood in his Eucharist, and we're strengthened. And here, here we are in another time and space a week later. And we find ourselves with St. Luke and Jesus on the way. They're moving, and so we're moving. We have Martha inviting the way, the truth, and the life God himself, Jesus, into her home for a meal, and Martha nearly groans the supper with her pride and envy and blame. Now, throughout this sermon, you're going to hear a comparison of Martha being task-oriented and Mary being relationship-oriented with her Lord, the one thing needful. And two, you'll hear how our liturgy, far from bringing one thing after another on the way to heaven, is filled with things leading us to the one thing needful, which is Jesus in the bread and the wine, where we find our relationship strict and present with our Lord Jesus Christ. And then I'm going to focus on Martha and what she really does to earn that Martha, Martha, that gentle scolding from Jesus. And I submit to you that it is Martha echoing Adam's original sin in paradise. She's going to echo it in her living room. But first a note on a common misunderstanding. If you ever noted how beautiful this church is, the altar guild, the property committee, the architecture, the art, how precise the music is. We have a lot of people that like everything at 90 degree angles and just right. This is one of the most beautiful churches I've ever been. There ought to be an award for the Alder Guild and the Property Committee. <laughs> like a plaque or something. And so we know what it's like to want everything right. So a common misunderstanding is that we people who like things just so feel that Martha is treated unfairly. That's often a remark I hear. Why does he yell at Martha? Because right now, if Jesus walked in here and said, hey, could you guys fix me a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? Oh my gosh. Some of us would be running over to Molly Stone. Some of us would be in the kitchen. We'd be looking, you know, setting a nice table for him. We'd be very, very, very busy getting everything ready for Jesus. We'd want to be good hosts and hostesses for Jesus. 
They're, we think of Mary, and she's busy in that kitchen. The pot's boiling over. The chicken got loose, probably went back out in the yard. <laughs> Microwave's beeping. No, that would be. <laughs> but you can't really blame Martha for being distracted with much serving. That's St. Luke giving us a little background about what's going on inside Martha's mind. But she is serving, isn't she? And we're called to serve. And Jesus is here to serve. So I don't think she's doing anything wrong. She's, you know, she's distracted, but who wouldn't be distracted? So we'll leave Martha cleaning dishes in the kitchen. And let's look at our daily balancing act of like, married relationships versus Martha tasks. How we can keep that in a balance. And I think it is in recognizing, as I did here, why I get weepy sometimes, is time and space is so wonderful, and we're sharing it with God who is beyond time and space. He's above eternity. God is above eternity, St. Thomas Aquinas. So, let me give you a good example of somebody who is surrounded by tasks and focuses on relationship, and her name's Opal Burleson. She was our realtor, and she was from the deepest south, Mississippi. And you could tell by her name Opal. Her sisters were probably Ruby and Pearl. <laughs> and Opal was a dynamo. And she was like at least 80 when, when we met her. And after uh, we got to know her, we'd see her around town. And one time near our house, we saw her selling two houses at the same time. And people were like bees around her with, you know, paperwork and, and potentials and briefcases full of money, whatever it takes to get this house. And, and we wave to her, and she beckons us over, like, oh my gosh. You know? So we go over, and all these people are hovering around Opal, and, and she's taking, you know, she's speaking with us. So after a while, I get kind of nervous, and I go, I go Opal, um, I, there are a lot of people, that, you're very busy, and, and, and there are a lot of people here, and, and you know, we ought to get going. And she touches my arm, and she goes, Peter and Joanne, I can sell a house anytime. Now, I must spend time with you. Oh, I felt so shiny and bright, I felt like a new tent. That she had put all these tasks aside to focus on Peter and Joanne and spend time with us. She was showing a way of honoring a relationship and being in space and time with us. Now, let me give you a bad example of task phrases, relationship, and that's me. So I'm in seminary, and uh, some of you know my personality, but, but those who know me best know me by my nickname, Little Jump, because my dad's nickname was Big Jump. And we're always kind of in a hurry and slightly distracted. And I was running up the steps to seminary to, let's say, go to pastoral care one-on-one. -on -one. I'm running up the steps to seminary. Descending the steps from on high is the president of the seminary, the Reverend Dr. Walter Stewart. And I go, good morning, sir. He goes, good morning, Peter. I go, how are you, sir, as I run up the steps? He goes, do you have time to find out? I go, nope. <laughs> And run right on up to pastoral care on the one. Oh. The Reverend Doctor had taught me in two seconds what I needed to learn as a pastor. When you enter into a relationship, it's not a task to be completed, but a blessing to be shared. The priest any of us, must be present in time and space, listening in the Skilling's garden, hearing a confession at the cafe, kneeling in the deathbed, anointing the sick, being the bridge, the root word for a priest, being the bridge in the relationship between God and his people. You need to be present in space and time for others. That day in Martha and Mary's house, Mary has chosen the good portion, the one thing necessary, which is to listen to Jesus, to honor the Son of God in their shared time and space, she's engaged in a relationship with Jesus her Lord. Now when Martha comes banging out of the kitchen, and you know she came banging out of that kitchen, 
filled with resentment and envy, she's about to commit what I am calling the echo of Adam's original sin. See if you can pick it up. Martha demands of Jesus, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? You tell her to help me. I put in the word you. You tell her to help me. Do you hear the echo of Adam after he'd fallen into sin? When God finds Adam and Eve hiding in the cool of the garden, and he says, you didn't do what I told you not to do, did you? Why did you do that? Who told you to do that? And Adam goes, the woman you gave me. In pride, that bright flame of pride, there's that shadow, dark shadow of blame. That's original sin. Pride, blame. The woman you gave me. And then there's Martha. You tell her to help me. The woman and God. Mary and God. Eve and God. Pride and blame. And Martha is now blaming God, not in paradise, but in her living room. Oops. <laughs> so no wonder Jesus says, Martha. Maybe with a notice about Martha. Martha. You're missing the one thing needful, the good portion of listening to Jesus, of sharing time and space with him, the son of the living God, of being in relationship with him. Well, we don't want to miss our chances to be with Jesus, to listen to him, share a meal with his very presence, and hear his promise to be with us even unto the end of the age. But it is difficult because we're busy. Hey, God, don't you know I'm busy? Well, in closing, let's look at our liturgy as the public work for the public good. It's kind of a way of trans translating liturgy, liturgia. A public work for the public good. This work can be a task, right? It can be a task. There's lots to do in a liturgy. Well, the pastor gets in the car and says, it's time to crank out the liturgy. Let's go. Well, that's not a good way of looking at it, right? We worry about when to stand or sit or kneel pray or sing. It can be like learning a new cheerleading routine. Learn to the left, learn to the right, stand up, sit down, bite the bite. <laughs> we can get distracted with much serving. As Martha got distracted with much serving. But the liturgy serves the people and serves God. The liturgy is not just one thing after another. But in the liturgy, we use things to praise God. We don't just complete a Sunday morning task distracted with much things, much serving. Instead, we're in a relationship with God who uses us and things, because we are things, body and soul. God uses things to glorify God. Music, art, movement, silence, architecture. To know Him and thus to know ourselves. Through things, we engage and are engaged by God through the Holy Spirit, through things in an eternal relationship. Things like bread and wine. The liturgy is not a task to do, but a relationship of things to do with God. It's not a task of things to do. It's a relationship of things to do with God. And I mean that to do with God and to do with God. So with St. Luke, we are on the way with Jesus to our graciously bestowed immortality by grace through faith. And today at the Eucharistic celebration, we will be given the one thing needful, the good portion, which is called the Viatica. So last week you learned the Eucharist by one name, the medicine of immortality. Today you learn another traditional name for it, the Viatica, the bread for the journey. We're on the way with St. Luke and Jesus. We need refreshment and strength. We need a good portion, the one thing needful, and that is the body and blood, in, with, and under things, bread and water. Not an empty symbol, but a sign that is present to the relationship of a higher reality, really present to us through his present, Christ's present. So to end, this week we have for the good of our body and soul, Jesus' body and blood.
the good portion, the one thing needful for our pilgrimage to this life, to the next. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us confess together the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth.
Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. We pray especially for the repose of the soul of Alvin Scholl, Jr. Lord, in your mercy. Yes. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessings on our church choirs that travel, glorifying your name through music. Keep them safe and sound, bring them home to us, happy and healthy. Lord, in your mercy. Yes. And Lord, thank you for sending through your spirit to us our new rector. Protect our new rector. Strengthen them. Help us to be a happy flock under her care. <clears throat> Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs> Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we want to repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the Holy Spirit, keep you for eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
They will be singing their first even song tomorrow. And tonight, I learned, or just right now, in fact, they are having dinner with the group or the choir that preceded them this past week. So they're getting all the lowdown of the ins and outs of Wells Cathedral. And for today's special announcement, thank you all for joining us, whether you're joining us live stream or here in person today. It has been 14 months and quite a journey since Thomas left us, or not left us, Thomas moved to St. Louis <laughs> last year. And he'll be joining us live stream today, uh, too, not joining us, but seeing what's going on, because he cares very deeply about St. Paul's. So, as I said, and I've talked about several times, it's been quite a journey we've been on. The first part of which started in September, when the previous vestry, which included four members who went off the vestry in January, except one who came back on, um, Kathy Martin, uh, Karen McCormick, um, and check my notes, I'm sorry. I have all this all lined up. Uh, Ann Cassells, who's at Wells, and Wade Aubrey, who is at the Open <laughs> as part of its 100. We, we do travel a bit, don't we? Um, so we started in September when the previous vestry um, launched the congregational conversations and the surveys that so many people either attended or filled out to identify what the strengths of St. Paul's were, what were some of our challenges, and most importantly, what we as a community were looking for in our next rector. So I'd like to thank on behalf of the vestry, those members of the search committee who are here today. First of all, our wonderful co-chairs, Charles Borden and Joan Cleary. We have a token that I forgot, and I'll ask Jay and Lisa to help with this. This is a token of thanks. Other members of the search committee who are here today are Rue Ritchie, Michelle Beauchard, who along with Charles did double uh, duty as also being a member of the vestry, and James Hurl from the Tongan congregation. Those who are not able to be, us, be with us today, traveling or awaiting the birth of a grandchild, are Tim Elliott, you can guess who's, who's who. Yeah. Tim Elliott, Jenny Lau, Edith Witherath, Anne Cassells, and Tom Powell. So again, we thank you from handing over the congregational conversations and the summary of the results of the survey to then you're going more in depth and creating that marvelous, marvelous representation of St. Paul's in our profile and the responses to the OTM. Then moving on to accepting applications, vetting them, and we had a large number of applications. As I understand it, I do not know the number, uh, nor at this point is it important, but I've been told that it's one of the largest that's been received by any church, Episcopal church, in the Bay Area or in our diocese, especially during this challenging time of the pandemic. Then narrowing that to those that they wanted to interview, and they interviewed by Zoom and then interviewed further finalists, semi-finalists that they were working on and hoping would be the ones that they'd be recommending to the vestry. In addition to that, they did reference check, and I think I have mentioned before that they then did another series of written reports to the vestry. So that the vestry in total had between 45 and 50 pages to read on each um, finalist that was presented to us. All very done, and done very, very well, as we would all expect. Their time ended by, re by recommending to us finalists. There were several. The vestry then did what I call visits. And you'll see in the letter that you're receiving and what's on the website that visits is really an understatement of what happened with the vestry. We spent, um, time over two days with each of the finalists. 
including a 90-minute interview. We did give a break. Um, it's getting water. Uh, and uh, small group discussions and interviews, as well as informal conversations. And each of our finalist candidates needed to uh, have a Eucharist for us and a sermon. And just coincidentally, the sermon was based on our readings for today. Little did we know, little did we know that the announcement would be made on today. We were hoping that last week or this week we'd be able to make it. The vestry also spent time uh, looking at all the paperwork provided um, by the search committee, uh, spent many hours immersed in it, and doing deep reflection on behalf of our community of who would be the best fit for what St. Paul's community said was important. So I want to thank the members of the vestry who are here today for their incredible dedication on behalf of us all. Fusi Mahulu and Lisa and Jay, could you help with mine? And uh, Brian Vanderloog, Alexandra Subray, Romanian, sorry, Alexandra, Denora Smith, and then uh, you, uh, you do get a second flower. Michelle and Charles, you can step over this side. <laughs> and then, of course, our co-junior wardens, Lisa Borgeson and Jay. We wanted all of you to have this token of genuine thanksgiving and gratitude for all that you have done. But the journey is not over. I am soon going to announce who our next rector is, and that will move us into the next part of our journey, which involves everyone, which will be the transition of the new rector into our midst. It'll be a transition for our new rector, he, she, or they, as well as a transition for all of us. Some of you may have been in other churches or at St. Paul's when there was a rector transition that went on. Things sometimes are a little uneasy in the beginning. We all need to remember that because we're getting used to a new person as well as that new person is coming into the midst of a community that may appear to the new person as knowing everybody and everything. We're thankful for the time that we've had with our interim rector, Jen Hornbeck, then with our transition rector, Beth Foote, who will be back next week, and for the special time that we had with Reverend, the right Reverend Swing, former bishop, and now in the last two weeks with Pete Garrison. Thank you so much. We have a few vestry members who are not able to be with us today, and I do want to acknowledge them. Kathy Martin, Paige Austin, and Bryce Dakin. So now, somebody's probably saying, stop the talking and just tell us. <laughs> so what was really important and what struck us in the profile was the balance of desires between experience and personal characteristics. And as the vestry discerned, which means we discussed and felt a calling, unlike so in many ways very different than a regular hire. Um, we kept both of those in mind and people were talking about both sides, the experience part as well as the personal qualities. And I want to tell you first who it is, secondly what we saw in summary of experience and personal qualities which made this person, our next rector, the best fit for St. Paul's. And fortunately, she said yes. <laughs> so we have called, with the blessings of Bishop Andrus, the Reverend Sarah Stewart, who is at All Saints Church in Atlanta, Georgia. So the search committee is surprised, too, because they did not know. Uh, so Sarah comes to us as the Associate Rector in All Saints, and All Saints is one of the largest Episcopal churches in the United States, as the Associate Rector for Young Adults and Innovation. But her portfolio there 
extended beyond. And as she said to us when we asked about the innovation, she said, well, really all of us there are innovators, but they put that title with young adults. <laughs> she has recently returned from a trip with teenagers and a few parents, an outreach trip to Greece, which is the second one she's led. She also has started many intergenerational and single generational small group discussions. She preaches regularly and celebrates regularly. And for those of you who love the internet, you'll be able to see her sermons on the internet itself, if you are so interested. Um, she grew up as a teenager in San Jose, California. So in many ways, she's coming home. She went to college in Denver, Colorado, and then accepted a job as an investment advisor with a nationally known investment group. While in Colorado, she was then promoted to vice president at a very young age of this group, of which she assured me there were many vice presidents, and then moved to Washington, D.C. She came to her allegiance and belief in the Episcopal Church while in college, after searching in many churches, non-Episcopal. And what she related to us is that she loved the liturgy in the Episcopal Church and repeated several times how she felt at home between the liturgy and also the openness to consider newer possibilities. When she moved to Washington, D.C., she became deeply involved in uh, an Episcopal church, St. Thomas, as I recall, in Washington, D.C., where within a few years she became a member of the vestry, served on a search committee. She was probably at that time in her early 30s, mid-30s. Um, also was uh, the lay leader in charge of formation uh, with children served on the altar guild and did many other things and during that time she felt a deepening call to seek ordination in the episcopal church like a few of our former rectors and interims she attended yale divinity school and was ordained and her first church as an associate rector was saint james in new york city Again, a large church. But she's had medium church experience too because she moved from New York City at the call of St. James, again, church in Wichita, Kansas. And from there she was called after a few years to All Saints in Atlanta, Georgia. So that's the experience. And, and across those three churches, as well as her lay experience, She's had experience across many of our ministry areas. She's very, very interested in youth formation, children formation, our music program, pastoral care, uh, and preaching and celebrating. So what about the personal characteristics? You'll find more about this in the letter that hopefully you will receive tomorrow morning, or not tomorrow morning, but tomorrow. Um, but I really liked, and you did not know about her, Pastor Pete, uh, when you talked at the end of your, or actually throughout your sermon today about relationship, because Sarah is all about relationships and building relationships. She's known as a collaborative leader. She likes to collaborate with people. She loves liturgy and preaching. She has com compassion and empathy. She was joyful when she was here with us and sharing her story and finding out more about St. Paul's. She's also, for her age, very optimistic about the future of churches, especially the future of the Episcopal Church, which she believes, based on her experience, does the best of combining tradition with openness to new opportunities, as they spoke about before. All of which were things that we were searching for on behalf of St. Paul's community. So, going forward, oh, wait a minute, sorry, I to make a note for ourselves. So, we have Sarah on clip, <laughs> if this all works. And Jocelyn, thank you very much. If it doesn't work, it's my fault. <laughs> <laughs>
Good morning, St. Paul's. I'm Sarah Stewart, and it is with great joy, excitement, and gratitude that I receive and accept this call to come among you and serve as rector of your community. I've been thinking about this old pop song, the lyrics of which say, I knew I loved you before I met you. I must have dreamed you into life. Now, I'm not so audacious as to think I possess that kind of power, but God does. And I have been amazed and delighted watching all the things God has dreamed into existence in the world through your loving witness to Jesus Christ. It is a dream come true to become part of a community of faith so rich with the fruits of the Spirit. Your love, your joy, your kindness and gentleness shines forth even all the way across the country that I've seen here in Atlanta, Georgia, and the faithfulness of your search committee and your vestry leadership in this season of transition. Wow, what a gift and grace. I've been thinking a lot about how this is also a dream come true for myself, returning to the part of the country where I grew up, getting to come back to the places where I used to play soccer tournaments, yes, in Burlingame too, and also to be reunited with my own extended family who still reside in the area I'm thrilled about the new and fresh dreams God will invite us to participate in as we dare to reach out in love to the world that God so cares for. I've been learning a little bit about love this summer, walking with a couple who are preparing for marriage. These are young folks I knew from days of ministry back in Wichita, Kansas. And they've reintroduced me to an author who's written a lot on the topic, Bell Hook's collection of essays all about love, new visions, bears powerful witness to the transformational potential of communities. She says there's no better place than community to learn the art of loving. She also lifts up M. Scott Peck's profound observation that it is in and through community where we find the salvation of the world. I do believe that communities rooted and grounded in the love of God that we know in Jesus Christ sweep us into that saving grace that truly changes us and sends us into the world to become a living sacrament. I'm so excited about what that will look like as we step forward into these years to come. For now, I ask your prayers as I prepare for a cross-country move and I indeed hold you in my own heart and prayers and look forward very much to meeting each and every one of you. May the grace of our Lord and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. So that is our announcement. But the remaining part of our journey, as I said, starts right now, or rather it starts on September 1st, when we, when Sarah will first arrive. She prefers to be called Sarah, or Reverend Sarah. Um, she will arrive and start with us on September 1st. Her first service will be, services will be Sunday uh, of Labor Day weekend, and we'll do an official welcome for her as part of our regathering service on September 11th, followed by a barbecue. Stay tuned as we set up opportunities for Sarah to meet with various ministry teams, various groups within St. Paul's, as well as individuals, because she truly wants to get to know each and every member of our community. So we look forward to the celebration of new ministries at St. Paul's, and we thank you all, especially the search committee who worked so hard on behalf of our community and my fellow vestry colleagues. It's been quite a journey. Sarah 
is all will all be on the website as of about 11:30 today. So you can watch her as many times as you want. Read more about her and about our journey uh, together. So thank you. We continue now with the offertory anthem. Thank you. 
From before time you made ready God creation. Your spirit moved over the deep and brought all things into being. Sun, moon, and stars, earth, wind, and waters, and every living thing. You made us in your image, male and female, and taught us to walk in your ways. But we rebelled against you and wandered far away. And yet as a mother cares for her children, you would not forget us. Time and again, you call us to live in the fullness of your love. And so this day, we join with saints and angels in the chorus of praise that rings through eternity, lifting our voices to magnify you as we sing. supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine. Again, he gave thanks to you, gave it to them, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you, and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Now gathered at your table, O God of all creation, and remembering Christ crucified and risen, who was and is and is to come, we offer to you our gifts of bread and wine and ourselves a living sacrifice. Pour out your spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the body of the living Christ. Breathe your spirit over the whole earth. And make us your new creation, the body of Christ given for the world you have made. In the fullness of time, bring us with all your saints, from every tribe and language and people and nation, to feast at the banquet prepared from the foundation of the world. Through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be all honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from 
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now to the world of peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you. 
with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you. Keep the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.